Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we're having a hero conversation. I will say this is one of my personal heroes because I've learned so much from this guy. He is a, a, a maverick out there. He's doing some really awesome things. He's also the host of Manufacturing Happy Hour, which if you haven't started listening, I beg of you, start listening to this guy's show. He brings on some great guests, great content. He's, he's serving industry in a wonderful way. His name is Chris Lukey. How you doing, Chris? I'm great, Chris. Thanks for having me on the show. And I could say a lot of those things right back at you. You do a wonderful job and it's an honor to be here on Eco Asks Why. And this has been so much fun. I know we, we started talking a few months ago trying to figure out how to collaborate together. And it's just, it's so fun that we've actually, met, we're making it happen now and bringing our audiences together. And hopefully, uh, you know, our audience will, will start following your, your content and information. Because I mean, I tell you one thing, whenever I wake up and it says there's a new episode of Manufacturing Happy Hour, man, that's a good day. Yeah. Hey, man, I, I appreciate it. And, and, you know, you hit on a great point right there. I mean, when, when someone asks me, how do I grow my podcast or something? I'm like, well, appear on other podcasts that have overlapping audiences, you know, right. and, and I think a lot of people, if they're not already, cause I know, I know some of we already have some mutual listeners, but hopefully uh, some more people from the manufacturing happy hour community come over your way and vice versa. There you go, man. Absolutely. And, and, I, well, I just certainly appreciate you coming on and I love to start the hero episodes because I'm, I'm just a, a storyteller and I love to hear good stories. And what about your personal journey, man? What led you to, you know, manufacturing happy hour and to where you're at right now? Yeah. So great question. And in, in many ways, manufacturing happy hour started out of necessity as much as passion and interest and in trying to play to my strengths. So to give some background, I spent the first 11 years of my career at Rockwell Automation working in sales, um, worked as an account manager in Houston, Texas for the first half, and then as an account manager out in the San Francisco Bay Area for the second half. So um, and to, to put that in a bit more context, you know, when I was working in the Texas market, you know, I was working with folks that had been at their companies for 20 30 years, you know, face-to-face -face meetings, handshakes, those were important. You know, the relationship aspect was a key part of selling in that market. You know, you kind of flip that on its head when you move out to the Bay Area. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of people have their visions of what it's like working in Silicon Valley, you know, a bunch of 20-something, 30-somethings wearing hoodies, typing away, writing code. Um, and, and while that's certainly an over-exaggeration, there is some truth to it. You know, I was moving to a market where people jumped around to different companies a lot faster, and the decision makers were younger. You know, I'm, I'm 33 right now. I was working with a lot of people that were my age that were calling the shots at, at the companies I was working with. So, I needed a way to reach that audience. You know, sure, face-to-face -face meetings still took place, but I had to just kind of self-reflect and think, how do I, you know, as a millennial, consume content? I'm listening to podcasts. I'm watching videos, things like that. Right. And, you know, the, the other part of that was, you know, so there's that necessity aspect. I'm like, if I'm going to reach my audience, I should start like a video series to get in front of them. But the other half of it was, you know, I used to play in rock bands and things like that, like cover bands, nothing, nothing big at all. But you know, that was, that was a hobby. And I'd, I'd kind of, I hadn't done that performance element in a while. I'm like, you know what? I, you know, some people are terrified of being on camera. That's not really the case with me. I'm like, I like jumping on camera and things like that. So I'm like, well, if it's a necessity to get in front of my audience, in front of my customers, and it plays to my strengths and plays to something I'm interested in, there's no reason I shouldn't start a start a video series. So one day, I, I it was a Saturday, I was at home, I poured a pint of beer, and uh, I recorded a video on my iPhone and sent it to some of my mentors in Rockwell. I'm like, I have this idea about a video series where we discuss, you know, a technology or a product or a trend in our industry over a cold one, and we call it manufacturing happy hour. What do you think? And, you know, I got the thumbs up, started doing it, and and I, I the rest is history. There's more to that story, but man, that's how it started. No kidding. Okay, so I mean that that initial pitch was a little video, yeah, to, to some of your your mentors there, and, and then you got the the green light. Yeah, it's it's funny because here here was my thought. I was thinking it's like, well, I should write an email to a, a couple people and see if they think this is a cool idea. I'm like, wait a second. I have an iPhone. Like I have all I need to make a video. I actually propped my iPhone at the time up on a selfie stick that I like stood like fixed in place with some books surrounding it. Like I didn't have 
any equipment beyond what I already had in my pocket, but I'm like, I'm going to shoot a video and pitch the idea that way. It just seemed like the more appropriate way to, to spin the idea of a video series. And, and since then, it's evolved into a podcast and an online community and things like that. But it started as just a little video series I recorded on my iPhone. Man, that is so cool, man. And then recently you made the leap to where you're really focusing a lot of your effort full time, right? On your job from podcasting, content, mm -hmm. things like that. I am. Yeah. So I, I recently left Rockwell. Um, I guess it's been about three months ago. And, you know, it was, it was just that point in my career. I'm grateful for all the opportunities Rockwell provided. It ultimately provided me the springboard and the life lessons and the education to do what I'm doing now. So, but, you know, you, you and I have, have talked before, you know, I, I, there's, there's some fulfillment I have in doing the podcast and helping other manufacturers, you know, create a more modern content creation game. So in addition to doing the podcast, you know, I'm helping out companies like, um, you know, Steam Chain, for example, a really cool industrial startup that does machine as a service. Won't get into that too much yet, but I'm helping them with, with their marketing efforts as well. So it's kind of taken the lessons I've learned from the past four years of podcasting and video work trying to find ways to, you know, help more people in the industry with that experience. No doubt, man. I mean, so making that, that jump full time was, was, uh, was it scary? You know, it's, yes, I, I would be lying to say if there was like, there wasn't a lot on my mind, but sure. maybe I'll flip this answer a little bit on, on its head, because I think I had, I had been doing the video series for about three, four years. So it's not like it's something that I had just created and was, t you know, I hadn't had some runway with. Right. I think honestly, Chris, I was getting to the point where it was going to be scarier or it was going to be the bigger risk to not take the chance, if that makes sense. You know, yeah. where you think it's like, gosh, you know, I've been doing this. I've kind of proven it works. Like, I think, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to have more regret down the line if I don't take this chance than if I do it and it doesn't work out. So it was almost the inverse of that. Once, once you got down to it, where it's like, man, I, I need to put myself in this uncomfortable position, make those moves where there might be a little bit more uncertainty, but you know, not having to live with, you know, 10 years down the line being like, man, I wish I'd done that. Or I wonder what would have, what would have been, been like if I had done that? I think that made the decision that much easier. No doubt, man. Well, I mean, you're, you're, you're going to do great things. I mean, you're, you're definitely, you had that experience too, that you could, uh, so you're not starting with a blank piece of paper. You kind of, you know, plays that work and then, you know, also know how to execute them very well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's and, and it's it's just practice. Like and, and you you know better than anyone. You do, you know, you're doing a ton over there at Eco Asks Why. You know, it's I think interviewing is an underrated skill. It's one of those things you need to prepare for. And and the reality is just like anything, it's nothing that you're an expert with the first time you do it. It's just getting those reps in, man, and doing a lot of podcasts is a great way to, to make that happen. Yeah, no doubt. It definitely will, you know, it, it will teach you a lot just for listening standpoint too. It makes you be a, a much more in tune listener if you host a podcast and because uh, then you have to, to really help navigate those conversations to best serve your guests as well as your audience that's listening. So good stuff, man. I mean, from Manufacturing Happy Hour, love the title, love the, you know, this manufacturing that's in it because that's obviously your mm -hmm. focus. So, you know, we're, we're out here at eco that's why we're supporting manufacturing too you know what is what are you seeing is changing the most in the way that you support manufacturing from a b2b perspective if you will so uh in terms of supporting manufacturing like it is a b2b industry and i think when it comes to doing digital media like we're doing whether it's a podcast whether it's a video whether it's you know stuff we post on social media the reality is i see there being this this cool op, this cool point in time where marketers need to become salespeople and salespeople need to become marketers. That's you know especially and, and being stuck at home for the past year ultimately really proved that um, where you need to the same way a salesperson would block time to do a sales call, go visit a customer. Now they need to block time to let's say post content on LinkedIn or respond to comments or do some prospecting through LinkedIn, things like that. Things that in the past, someone might have been, well, that's marketing's job. Well, the reality is at the end of the day, marketing and sales have the same goal. You're trying to grow your business. You're trying to drive sales. So 
I think that's that's where I see one of the biggest changes, one of the biggest evolutions is where, um, and, and based on necessity, we had to do it. Salespeople had to do it. We're seeing that overlap in sales and marketing. We're seeing those lines blurred a little bit more. No doubt. I mean, I, when you were talking, think, something popped in my head because it was come up in a couple of episodes and it was really come up in some cybersecurity episodes. I'm going mm. to make a connection here. People talk about IT, OT convergence. What I'm hearing you say is that sales marketing convergence as well. Yeah. That, that's an opportunity. I mean, that's really where it's at. And I'm not sure why the worlds are different, but they definitely are getting those lines are blurring, if not can being completely erased in the mm -hmm. way that you're having to serve your customers now, because if you're not, you know, really straddling both sides of the fence or wanting to learn from both sides, man, you're, you're missing a big opportunity to serve people well. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it, I think it just comes down to that common goal. Like it's, it's interesting in the past, I think maybe, may, and, and maybe this is unique to the manufacturing industry. People thought of marketing as, oh, that's events, that's trade shows and things right. like that. But you know, COVID gave us an opportunity to really reset that and say, you know, at the end of the day, the activities marketing is doing, they're just trying to grow sales. They're trying to grow business and revenue the same way sales is as well. I shouldn't say the same way. They're, that's the common goal. They're just using different tactics to do that. And now when everyone's working from home, we realize we can take tools from the marketing toolbox and put that in the sales toolbox and, you know, vice versa, take tools from the sales toolbox and put it in the marketing toolbox. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Absolutely, man. Well, again, do, thank you for, for that advice, that wisdom there. And, and when you talk about the podcasting and what's going on, you know, there are a lot of people who start podcasts. And I think I even heard you mention a stat on one of your episodes where you're talking about the number, the percentage of a podcast that don't get past, was it four or 10 episodes and they, they fall off. Um, it was, it was really high. It stood out to me. as yeah. like, wow, you can start off with a bang, but if you really don't have a, a good plan. So maybe talk to the people out there that are thinking about podcasting and they, when they think of a podcast, they have this vision in their mind. Like, I want you just to debunk that for us. <laughs> well, I, I think the, that that's a great question, Chris. And I think the first part of maybe the miss, the first misconception around podcasting is that it's going to be easy. Like right. it's, you know, it's, it's doable. There's no doubt about that, but like anything worth doing, it takes work. Mm -hmm. You know, like we already talked about that interviewing is not a throwaway skill. It's something you have to invest time in and it's something that you hone and dial in over time. So interviewing is just part of it. But as you know, like you and Adam over at Eco Asks Why, it takes, you know, it takes thought and effort and energy and time to plan out your content calendar, to prepare for the interviews, to produce and get the shows out there and then promote them afterwards. You know, all of a sudden, you know, a podcast, which you might think was just one thing you had to do, all of a sudden is these five things that you kind of need to weave and work together to to make it work, work out. So I think that's, that's the first thing I'd debunk around podcasting. And I, I like that you brought up that stack. Cause I think it is uh, off the top of my head. It's like something like 10 or 12, like people get to 10 or 12 episodes before they pull the, you know, around when they pull the plug. Um, and it's usually not even pulling the plug. It's just, it kind of fades out. They're just like, Oh, this was a lot of work. I need to do, you know, life, life comes at you. There are other things that are important you need to do. And yeah. it just kind of tapers off. But um, the, the other thing I would, you know, try, I guess, try to debunk or try to save people from is like, you know, look for the small wins when you're first starting to podcast. I think a reason people fall off is that they're looking for, you know, Joe Rogan, Gary Vaynerchuk level downloads. They're expecting this audience of hundreds of thousands of people to come to you. And, right. and that's just not the case. The reality is, you know, you're just, look, you're looking for the right audience, even if it is only a few hundred people. And, You'll, you know, if you do it for even, even for, for those first 10 to 12 episodes, someone will reach out and be like, Hey, I loved this in this episode, or I, I took this away. So look for those small wins and find a way to have that be one of your catalysts to keep you going. No doubt, man. Absolutely. And, and I guess, you know, when, when you're hosting the show and you're doing your thing, you're, and you're having that sense of fulfillment and joy in your work, you know, I guess, what are you doing in those moments? What, what brings you that sense of joy? You know, I think, I, I, wow, great question. I think one of the things that always hits me, and I don't, I don't think I've talked about this on a show before, but, you know, sometimes when I'm getting ready for a podcast and I have all these other things in life and work that I need to do, just like, oh, you know, the dishes are dirty, or I didn't get this email out to this customer, these other things are adding up. I'm just like, 
I'm not necessarily in the mood to jump in and do a show sometimes that hit that that I think that hits everyone when they're even if they're doing a job you, you love like some days you're for whatever reason your mind's just not in it but every time I finish an episode I'm just like wow I'm so glad I did that like that was a great conversation I learned this and that or I connected with this individual I didn't know on this level before. It's I think what one of the things that that keeps me going and brings that sense of fulfillment is just the positive feeling at an end of an interview. And as someone that's an extrovert that feeds off the energy of conversations like this, it's just something that, you know, when when we, you know, and end our conversation here at noon today, central time, you know, I, I'm going to be pumped up for the rest of the day. That's going to translate to more productivity and the other things I'm doing after this. And um, it's just that feeling at the end of recording an episode. I think that's one of the intangibles that keeps me going. I feel you. And, and I'm with you 100%. And uh, until you're on this side of the mic that we're used to being on, I guess you can't really understand that. But uh, man, it's it, it I definitely a hundred percent with you on that. It's just, it really is a great feeling. And I've also noticed on LinkedIn and you, you provide a lot of guidance to people starting podcasts and, and starting mm -hmm. new things and, and trying to give them advice and, and, and uh, tips on how to get going. Have you, from a mentorship standpoint, have you found that to be fulfilling? And maybe what, what, where do you find that you're, that you're sharing on a consistent basis with people that are trying to start podcasts to serve whatever that industry that they're in? Yeah, it definitely is one of the things that keeps me going. It's it's funny. The first thing that popped up when you mentioned that was, you know, I'll I'll talk social media here for just one second. When people are wondering what they should share on social to their networks, you know, to their customers and things like that, I'm like, well, just help people, you know, solve their challenges, help them solve their problems, share content that helps them address a need. And for me, I've got that podcasting experience. So I'll just share a tip on LinkedIn. It doesn't need to be anything quick, you know, anything that intense or anything that long. It could just be something like we talked about before, like just saying I could do a quick post saying, hey, interviewing is not a throwaway skill. It takes time. Just look at people like Larry King and Howard Stern that have made careers out of it. Like think about those people when you're preparing for your interviews. So um, I know that was a bit of a roundabout way to answer your question, but yeah, ab absolutely. Just, you know, and, and, and I think that's where I made the career move as well, where it was just like, you know, I see an opportunity. I see an audience and a market for helping people be more effective with their messaging, whether it's through podcasting, social media, or video. No doubt, man. I mean, you, and you're doing such a great job, you know, with that, I guess, you know, when you look back through, through the, the guests that you have, you know, does anything stand out from what you've learned the most from someone or that, that, that advice that just really stands out and that, that really impacted you? Any, any moments stand out or maybe like cool guests that just blew your mind with what they said? Yeah. So the first thing that, and, and I've been fortunate to interview some, some really cool people. Like, I mean, one of my earlier interviews was with Z Holly, um, Christina Z Holly. She created the TEDx program, essentially. Like it was cool. You know, it's been cool to sit across the table yeah. uh, with people like that. But, you know, if I think of a lesson I've learned over the past year, and I think this translates to a lot of work, a common theme I've heard through my podcast, and you mentioned cybersecurity earlier, this comes up on those episodes I do, it's that at the end of the day, the most you need people, processes, and technology to make things happen. Um, that's especially true in the manufacturing industry, but, you know, that's true for starting a podcast, or that's true for really any work you're doing. And it goes in that order. You need the right people to get things done. And then you need right. the right processes. And then you find the technology and the tools that make it easier. And, and I know that's maybe a bit more techy of, of an answer than you might have been expecting, but it's just, it, 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 it's just been such a common theme, whether it's IT, OT convergence, like you mentioned, yep. whether it's you know, digital transformation, whether it's cybersecurity. I'm just like, this is all, it's, it's always the same answer. It's all, it's, 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 there are different details to each of them, but it's always people, processes, and technology. That's awesome, man. How about, has it led to any opportunities? I know you were a speaker, I think, at Content Marketing World. Has, what types of opportunities has just running Manufacturing Happy Hour opened up for you outside of the podcast itself? You know, one of the things that I, I think it, it's a door opener. I, I think we've, we've talked about this before in some of our conversations, like 
and and I want to make sure I phrase this right. It's not I'm not famous, but like the the thing is when you talk to someone, um, you know, in our industry, for example, or when you're getting on a cold call with someone right. or a, a new customer, they're like, oh yeah, I've heard you on this podcast before, or hey, I listened to Manufacturing Happy Hour. So yeah. you kind of build up that credibility over time you know, to a wider audience rather than having to do it just one-on-one -on -one the whole time. Like that's because, because I don't know even why fame, because I was trying to figure out the right word for it, but it's just like, you're able, the fact that you're doing this work on a consistent basis, you're yeah. able to influence people on a regular basis in that regard. That's really what I was trying to say. Hey man, you're famous to us, man. So <laughs> I'm cool with sticking with famous, but yeah, you, that influence is big. I mean, really, because that's what you are. You're an influencer, you're helping people. And I uh, mean, you're just, you're doing great stuff. And with the hero episodes, what I love, Chris, if it's okay, we, we, we kind of get off the career path and we talk yeah. a little bit outside of, outside of work and just let our listeners learn more about you. So, sure. you know, how about get us started with, you mentioned you're a music guy and you had played in some bands earlier, but just curious, any hobbies you have? Yeah. I mean, music is definitely one of, one of them. Like I'm, I'm, I've been a big punk rock guy, you know, ever since I was 15 years old, I feel like whatever you listen to in high school sticks with you for the rest of your life that like that becomes your genre. So um, I play guitar actually, you know, one of the benefits of being at home for the past year was I actually got to pick up the guitar again because I would be traveling around, you know, like anyone I was traveling around for work. I didn't have as much leisure time to do some of those hobby type uh yeah. type of activities but um guitar music is certainly one of them another fun one that i don't probably i probably don't talk enough about on podcasts is i'm a big roller coaster junkie oh uh, okay i i uh in fact that's why i originally got my engineering degree because i wanted to design roller coasters that was that was my dream job and then i realized I liked being, you know, more of a salesperson, more of a marketer than being an engineer. To be an engineer that designs roller coasters, you need to be an engineer first. And I kind of figured out my strengths and passions over time. So that's neither here nor there. But man, do I still love riding roller coasters. My ultimate uh, um, time sink activity, there's a cool website called rollercoasterdatabase.com. Man, you can look at okay. pictures and stats of every roller coaster around the world. If, uh, if I want to waste an hour of my life, I shouldn't yeah. say waste, but if I want an hour of my life to disappear quicker yeah. than I would think, roller coaster database, uh, that's, that's a great procrastination activity of mine. Okay. So, I mean, you, so you're, you're that type of junkie. So what's your, your top, uh, top one or two coasters that you've rode, man? Yeah. Good, good question. There is a, a super tall roller coaster. It's like 200 feet tall. It's called a hyper coaster, meaning it breaks 200 feet uh, called Superman out in Six Flags, New England. Um, but I'll, I'll throw something out that probably more listeners are familiar with. One of my favorite places in, in the world is an amusement park in Sandusky, Ohio called Cedar Point. Okay. Um, it's a peninsula on Lake Erie with some of the raddest roller coasters you've ever imagined um okay. it is a playground for any roller coaster junkie man that is awesome i've uh i don't share the same sentiment around roller coasters <laughs> but uh i can appreciate that you're passionate about them man that's awesome <laughs> it's a polarizing activity if you don't like heights roller coasters probably aren't yeah. for you there people seem to be on one end of the spectrum or another they love them or it's like i can do without them <laughs> yeah I, i'm on the other end but that's okay <laughs> yeah that's uh, fair that's fair yeah those and, and then obviously craft beer i'd say would, would round out another hobby of mine i mean manufacturing happy hour there had to had to be a beer tie-in there you go there you go how about family we love at eco as well we feel like we're a family yeah at eco in general but just yeah the clients we serve anything you'd like to share about your family yeah so you know i'm i'm one of three siblings i've got a brother that's out in new york city a sister that lives in melbourne australia um and my parents still back home in st louis missouri where uh, where i'm originally from so um funny thing that happened in the past year was i i actually I be I am now the closest to home now that I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is still a six hour drive from St. Louis, but you know, it's far closer than San Francisco was. So, you know, our parents instilled us with an adventurous spirit early on, you know, yeah. um, not only in our personal lives, but in, in our careers as well. So that's been a, a real gift 
um, I think back to, you know, when I would watch my dad, you know, cause I used, when I was a kid growing up, I'd wake up early in the morning to wave goodbye to my dad when he was leaving for work. Uh, he was a teacher and an administrator at a high school um, for his whole career. I'd w- uh, wake up early to wave to him at like 6 a.m., 5.30 a.m., whatever it was, and then go right. back to bed. But I feel like that is one of the things that impacted my hard working, you know, spirit that I've had throughout my career. Just seeing someone get up, for work every day, go to a job they love. I think that was a tremendous impact that, uh, that I learned from my parents. Thank you for sharing that with our listeners. And how about, I know you're a podcast guy, you're, you're, you're YouTube. You have a lot of things going on there too. Any podcast, it could just be personal. It could be business or YouTube channels, books, things like that, that, that you find value in that you think listeners may enjoy. Yeah, you know, I'll I'll share a book right off the bat because I I do listen. It's funny the podcasts I listen to are really niche. Like I went to Marquette yeah. University, I listened to a Marquette basketball podcast, things like that. So you know that's so rather than go the podcast route, something that I think for this audience, you know, my favorite book that I don't think I've talked about on podcasts enough is by Keith Ferrazzi. It's a book yeah. called um, Never Eat Alone. And it talks about the power of relationships. It has some great tactics for, you know, keeping in touch in an authentic way, whether that's a personal connection or a professional connection. Right. Um, you know, ne- Never Eat Alone is probably my favorite self-help business book that I've ever read. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to get that, man. I, mean, I haven't, haven't read that one, so it's on the list now. It's a good one. It's a real easy read. And hopefully as trade shows come back, has a lot of great tips in there for how to maximize. I think it's uh, how, like called how to be a trade show guru or like a king of the trade show or whatever it is, like to really maximize your impact when you're there. So it's got, it's got some cool chapters in there for sure. That's awesome, man. We'll, we'll link that up for our listeners too in the show notes so you can check that out. Uh, one thing we started doing, Chris, and maybe you'll be willing to play along is a lightning round. Just okay. asking random stuff, man. Um, yes. So just answer at will. If you want to pass, I, I may give you one pass, but not two. <laughs> you know? so, I am so here for this. I'm up for the challenge, Chris. All right, man. So let's start. We got to start here with you since you're the host of Manufacturing Happy Hour. So favorite adult beverage, man. Oh, man. Craft beer. My favorite beer is from Four Hands Brewing in St. Louis, Missouri. It's called Citywide Pale Ale. It's the perfect mix of drinkability and flavor. Okay. All right. So you are pale ale. There you go. How about, so you're from St. Louis. I'm curious, like favorite sports teams. I'm really into the St. Louis blues right now. You know what, you know, having watched them my whole life and then seeing them finally win a Stanley cup in 2019, they, they are certainly my top interest in sports. Okay. Okay. How about uh, all time favorite movie? Ooh, gosh, that is a great question. You know, I think Office Space. I finally came okay. to the realization that uh, it's just such a classic. Like, it, it ages so well. I wrote a blog article um, two years ago on the 20th anniversary of the movie called right. 20 Business Lessons We Can Still Learn from Office Space 20 Years Later. It's amazing how well that movie has aged. Even though technology has changed a little bit, all of the things they spoof or critique in that movie are still exactly the same. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. How about, I'm um, curious with your, with your punk rock answer earlier, how about uh, music or bands? Favorite band? So there's a band called New Found Glory. They've been around for over 20 years. They're what you'd call a pop punk band. I have seen them 21 times live throughout my music going career. This is over the course of like 18 years or so, to be clear, but I, that's a lot for a single band. Okay, that is a lot, man. You're definitely supporting them pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Any, I'm sure you had a few adult beverages there while you were at those concerts, right? <laughs> Ab- absolutely, absolutely. The craft beer selection at these shows has gotten better over the years, for sure. Nice, nice. Now, have, with with any beer, you have to pair it with a good food. So, what what what's what's your favorite food, man? Mm, favorite food. You know, I, I'm pretty uh, American in this regard. I love a good burger. I love searching for the best burger in a new city when I'm somewhere. You know, some unique things like toasted ravioli is a unique St. Louis uh, Italian appetizer. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my uh, kudos to toasted ravioli and hamburgers is my okay. go-to. There you go. And the last two, because I, th- I think I've heard you talk about on your show, you're, you're a pretty big traveler. You like to get out. You like to see the world. Mm-hmm. Where, where's the, 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 the best place you've ever been? And then also, mm-hmm. where, where would you like to go that you haven't been to yet? 
Wow. Um, so as far as my favorite spots, I kind of have like a top 10 list. You know, I feel really lucky that San Francisco was, you know, one of my favorite cities in the world. I got to live there for five and a half years. You know, Berlin, Germany and uh, Montreal, Canada are two other favorites that are near the top of that list. That is awesome. Um, and as far as spots I still want to go, I'm going to keep it a little close, uh, slightly closer to home right now. It's still across the border, but uh, Oaxaca, Mexico. Um, I've been to Mexico City. Love that spot. Just, I mean, huge city. Um, it, a lot of fun. Great cuisine. I've heard Oaxaca is just one of the best places to go to eat some of the best food in the world. So Oaxaca, oh, okay. Mexico. Gotcha. Okay. Well, man, you, you, you crushed the lightning round. I'm not surprised <laughs> with, with, your, with your podcast background, but man, that was a lot of fun. Thank you, Chris, because it really gives our listeners a little more insight to who you are, right? Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, no, that was that was good. I, I need to, I, you're giving me some ideas, Chris, I need to incorporate some of that back into my show. We've gotten so focused and, and it's been good. We still get to hear people's stories, but that was a lot of fun. I like that. Oh, cool, man. Cool. Well, we always wrap the show up with the why too, Chris, you know, we call it eco S why. And that's what I'm passionate about the passion what what drives people. And so if somebody was to come up to you and maybe they're in your favorite pub or your favorite bar and they did want yeah. to know what Chris Lukey's why is, you know, mm -hmm. what's your answer going to be? You know, I think my why comes down to, I want to help people create the things that have always been inside of them waiting to get out. You know, for me, podcasting has been a great medium for that, but I feel like a lot of people have a hobby or a dream or something they've always wanted to do in their career, something they've always wanted to create that, for whatever reason, they, they just haven't done it yet. Haven't done it yet. You know, I want to help people get business results. I want to help people bring in new clients. That's all part of the game. But I also want to help people create content and create solutions that they're proud of. I think that's that's my why. And I haven't gotten to articulate it like that in a while. So thank you for that question, Chris. Well, man, you're to 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 back up your why with the with with an answer. I mean, you're, you're crushing it and you're doing a great job. You've, you've provided a lot of inspiration for me. Uh, just watching what you're doing. I've learned so much just listening to you and, and watching and even reaching out and asking, you've been very receptive to offering advice. And, um, yeah, so I wish you nothing but the best blessings for you in the future, man, but manufacturing happy hour, uh, continued growth. So just thank you for what you're doing to serve industry. Likewise, Chris, thanks so much for having me on. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S. -S 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 -S